you know, Pastor Ben's coming up, and, and we know each other from way back, and he's a, he's, he's, he's a brother, um, and, and we're all, we talk once in a while. I, I went to, I, when I go on vacation once in a while, I end up in Palm Springs. He's a church I go to. The other day I went to his church. He wasn't there. His church is growing. That's why he has a, he has a campus pastor there. They just got into their new building, and, and they've been working on They put a brand-new parking parking lot there. We need more churches in America that are filled with the presence of God. And he has a, he has a anointing on his life or a gifting on his life to be a pastor, but also to be an entrepreneur. And that means he's a success in the business world, but he's a success as a pastor too. And we were talking about it in the back and, and how to live life and be a pastor, you need to master both. Uh, and the reason you need to master both because there's a, there's a lot of business side to run in a big organization like this. And this is what I found out. The greatest leaders in the world are church leaders. Because we're, understand, understand this. You're leading a group of people that are volunteering to follow you. They're not following you for a paycheck. They're following you because they're getting some value. And what God is saying, I'm raising you up to be a value leader. Let's get Pastor Obed a way we're allowed reach welcome and let him know you're ready to receive an impartation from God tonight. Let him know you, you are happy to hear a word. God bless you guys. Love you guys so much. Come on, let's give the Lord a big clap offering right now. Come on, can we give Jesus the biggest round of applause? He's been so good to us. We thank you, Lord. Well, you may be seated for about five seconds, and then I'm going to have you stand right back up. But no, it's a joy to be back with you. And one of the greatest churches in America. I remember the first time I came here, after service, I was in the back, and I told the pastor, Oh, pastor, I said, man, this is the best kept secret in the world. Like, what are you guys doing? You guys are changing. Man, 19 years. 19 years. Wow. You know, the greatest anointing today is not how great of a sermon you can preach it's not how many people you reach. It's not how articulate you are. It's not how many followers you have on social media. You know, the greatest anointing today is that you can last. <laughs> Ministry is a setup for burnout. 16,000 pastors leave the ministry every year. 16,000. The pressure, the betrayal, the hurt. I was sitting there and I'm thinking 19 years. Some pastors don't even last 19 months. The one thing that you have. It's not a big building, not a fantastic children's ministry, not a brand new cafe that's better than Starbucks. But you guys have a pastor that you know who prays, who fasts, who believes God. Come on. And you know the devil's trying to throw everything at him. And for 19 years, they've stood on this pulpit, not compromising, not sinning, not sitting there backing off. Come on, you ought to give your pastors the biggest round of applause right now. In Jesus' name, we honor you. I love you guys. I tell they're in the back, you guys look better than ever before. You can remain standing as we... As we open up God's word, I, I believe that if the president of the United States walked in, regardless of what party they're a part of, it's just respectful to stand up. But how many know the king of kings is here? So we can stand up when we open up the Bible. Amen. And so as you open up your Bible, go to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. And so honored to have my 
My youth pastor's here with me today, Pastor Jeff and Pastor Deb, and we love them. Come on, can you honor them tonight as well? And sons and daughters of the house. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I want to take the next few minutes and speak to you a message I've entitled, You Are the Exception, Not the Rule. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation and give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. God, I pray you give us a mind to perceive and a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we will never be the same. In Jesus' name, come on. And all God's people who came on a Friday night, say amen and amen. Well, before you're seated, give someone a high five and say, you wish you looked as good as me. You wish you looked as good as me. I often like to start a sermon with a question. And the question I want to start off with you tonight is, why does the devil hate you so much, yet God loves you so much? Have you really thought about that question? Like, why does the devil hate me so much when I've done nothing to him? I haven't talked about his mama. I didn't dump his sister. Why is it that he hates me so much, yet God loves me so much? Think about this. You never sinned against Satan, yet he hates you. But you sinned against God, and he madly is in love with you. It doesn't make sense unless you understand the origin and the being of who Satan is. We all know that Satan is not a devil. He's a fallen angel. We know that God has given angels charge over us. And we understand that angels are beneath us. We also understand that angels only have the sight to see to the horizon which means God never gave them the ability to see into your tomorrow. They can only see as far as the horizon. And so this is why Satan, if he ever tries to intimidate you about tomorrow, you know he's always lying. Because he doesn't have the ability to see into your tomorrow because tomorrow is only in God's hands. But here's why he really hates you. You see, the name Lucifer means a light bearer. But Jesus said something about you. He said, you are the light of the world. Matter of fact, Satan sins one time and gets kicked out of heaven. You've sinned all kinds of times. And you've been given the invitation to heaven. Think about this, that, that, that one of the responsibilities of Lucifer in heaven was that he was guarding the ark of the testimony, which is the law of God. Yet, God gave you the ability to defeat him by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Oh, no, no, let's think about this, that, that one of his other responsibilities was that he protects the Ark of the Covenant, which means that he was always the closest to God than anybody else. But you, being a covenant child of God, you always have access to the throne of God. You see, the reason why the devil can't stand you is because you became the exception. And not the rule. Like, 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 let's, 
let's, let's talk about that for a moment. The principle of exception actually means a person who is excluded from the average, the familiar and the common, a case to which normal doesn't apply. You see, most of us, if we're honest, if we were the rule, we wouldn't be here tonight. Some of you would be six feet beneath the ground. Some of you would be locked up. Some of you still be on the streets. But God chose you. And when God chose you, he chose you not as the rule, but as the exception. Oh, I'm going to preach this tonight. Think about Daniel. Daniel was in the lion's den. Should have been eaten up. But God made an exception. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. They should have been, they should have been burnt to the dust, but God made an exception. Think about a teenage boy named David who walked up to a Goliath that even the children of Israel were intimidated. But by one sling and one rock, God, come on somebody, made an exception. Think about a woman in her 90s who laughed and her husband says, you're going to get pregnant. All of a sudden gets pregnant. Why? Because God had made an exception. Think about the children of Israel walking around the walls of Jericho seven days and seven times and when they shouted come on your voice can't knock down a wall but God come on can make an exception think about a dead man named Lazarus when God showed up four days late according to Mary and Martha but Jesus walked up to the tomb and yelled at his name and said Lazarus come forth because how many know when God shows up it's always on time why because God can make an exception Think about your life. Your life was so messed up, so jacked up, but all of a sudden one day you got invited to come to the Way World Outreach. You heard the message from God. You came running down these altars and God wiped your sins away. He invited you into heaven. Why? Because you have been made the exception. You see, most of us, don't even know what we have because the truth is you're still trying to figure out who you are you see in Zechariah chapter 8 God is speaking and he says among the other nations Judah and Israel became symbols of a cursed nation but no longer now I will rescue you and make you both a symbol and a source of blessing. So don't be afraid, be strong, and get on with rebuilding the temple. In other words, what God was saying is because you're the exception, when you should be wearing grave clothes today, when you should be looking like your addiction, when you should be carrying the residue of your past, God says, I'm about to do such a work in your life that there would not even be an evidence of where you came from. Why? Because at the end of the day, God says, I'm about to make you the source and I'm going to make you the symbol of my blessings on your life. Can I go deeper? The other reason why the devil hates you is because Lucifer was one of only three angels that were created with such a distinction. He was the angel of worship. His light would illuminate the heavens. And yet when he sinned and got kicked out, God had to replace it because heaven still had Gabriel, who was the messenger. It still had Michael, who was the fighter, but it lost Lucifer, who was the worshiper. So heaven still had a fight. Heaven still had a message. 
but it didn't have a fighter. So if God was going to create something to take that place, he would have to create them with a distinction. Which means he could not replicate or try to create without it being a distinction. So because God could have made anything, he could have made you brighter than Lucifer. Could have made your pipes greater than Lucifer. But God went so far beyond that that he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create them in my image. And the Bible says, God said, let us make man according to my image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over the cattle and all the earth, and over the creeping things that creep the earth, and then God blessed them. God never has blessed an angel. God has never blessed a tree, an animal. The only distinctive thing that God has blessed is the very reflection of who he is and those who've been called the exception and not the rule. I'm going to go deeper. And so when he made man, he said, be fruitful and multiply. Which means that not God did not only just make you in his image and likeness, meaning you reflect who he is and then you should act like he is. But he commanded within you that you would be fruitful. You would multiply. That's when you're righteous. But when you're unrighteous, you don't bear no fruit. And surely you don't multiply, you subtract. So this is why when you came to church, you were broke. You were messed up. You didn't have a lot. Because if God is the God who multiplies, then Lucifer must be the one who subtracts. Why would you want to serve the devil who subtracts when you should be serving God? Come on, somebody, who multiplies your life. So the first thing that God gave man was identity. The first attack in the Bible was identity. Lucifer disguised as a snake, speaks to Eve in the absence of her husband because the enemy will always attack you when you're away from your authority. And he said, if you eat of that tree, you will be like God. The temptation of the enemy is always the same. It just comes packaged differently. Because the origin of temptation is to reverse the role. You are the reflection, his image. He is the substance. Which means you were created to be God-like. Not to be like God. So every time you sin, you take control because you decide, I'm going to be like God. Instead of being submissive as his reflection and being God-like. So the first thing God gave man was identity. The first attack in the Bible was identity. And the first attack of Jesus was his identity. Why? 
Because if you don't know who you are, then you don't know what you came from. You didn't come from your mom. You came from God. Your carnal man reflects your parents. But your spirit man reflects your father. Come on, can I teach tonight? So the first blessing that God gave you was his identity. Then all of a sudden, scripture moves to Genesis 12, and God establishes a covenant with Abraham and calls him the father of faith. And in your multiplying, I will multiply you. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes, he breaks the curse. And Paul's writing in Galatians, and he says, through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles, watch this, with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that who we are, believers, might receive the promise through the Holy Spirit through faith. So the first blessing God gave you was identity. The second blessing through Abraham is the blessing of prosperity. <laughs> then all of a sudden Jesus comes on the scene he breaks the curse and the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 now if we are children then we are what? heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order we ought to share in his glory so watch this the first blessing God gave you was identity the second blessing that comes from Abraham is the blessing of prosperity and then all of a sudden Jesus comes and hands you the keys of the kingdom and the blessing that he gives you is the blessing of authority. Now watch what I'm preaching tonight. It all begins with the blessing of identity. So if I know who I am and I know where I came from, then I will never lack another day in my life. Because my identity leads me to the blessing of prosperity. And when I'm prosperous, it leads me to the place of authority. See, the reason why the church doesn't have authority and the reason why it doesn't have prosperity is because it's been attacked with its identity. And so the devil knows if I can rob you of your identity... I'll rob you of your prosperity. And if I can rob you from your prosperity, I'll rob you from authority. That's why people that lack got no voice. You can't change the world if you're in lack. And your life was never meant to be in lack. Your, your, your life was created to carry his identity, walk in his prosperity, and govern this earth with his authority. This is why, this, this is, this is why the devil hates you. Because he knows the power you possess. And the problem is most of the church doesn't even know it. You're running against something that you've already been called to overcome. You're, you're up at night worried about something and being overwhelmed when in all reality, if you knew who you were and you knew the authority that you carried, you would tell that devil to get out my house and he has no residence in this place. We spend more time trying to figure everything out instead of figuring ourselves out. We got to get back to, to who we are. So let me give you really quick three things, three significant truths regarding this exception in identity. The first is that the blessing of your royal nature cannot be overridden by people. No, no, the blessing, watch this, 
of your royal nature cannot be overridden by people. This is why if man didn't create you, they can't cancel you. You see, all the devil's been wanting to do was just cancel the purpose that God has placed in your life. You're going to make me dig tonight, huh? Watch this, Jeremiah chapter 1. Before I formed you, before, 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 before I formed you, I can't form anything if my hand's not on it. This is why the first six, the first five days of creation, everything came out of the mouth of God. But on the sixth, when he was going to create something that would be so distinctive, it could not come out of his mouth because then it would just be common like the rest of the five. So what he had to do was take his hand from heaven and get some dust and begin to form man from the dust of the ground. Let me tell you something. You're so distinctive and you got an exception that you didn't even come out of the mouth of God. Come on, you got formed by the hand of God. And you talking about God ain't around. I don't know if God's around. Before I formed you, in the womb, I knew you. Not, I know you, or I am around you to start knowing you. He says, I knew you. The question is, is what does he know of me that I don't know myself? This is why God couldn't stand still. Because he knew who Adam was. But as soon as Adam sinned and the glory lifted and he picked up fig leaves to cover himself because what happens is every time you lose your covering, you'll always settle for a cover-up. So when God looked down, he was looking for his shadow. He was looking for his reflection. But he couldn't see it. So you matter so much to God that he had a step from his throne. And the Bible says he came walking in the cool of the day. And he was looking for Adam. How can a God who's omnipresent everywhere at the same time, an omniscient who's all-knowing, would go looking. So the question you got to ask yourself was, who was God looking for? The Adam that's covered up or the Adam that he knew? You want to know why God never stopped pursuing you? Because every time he looked at you, he couldn't see his reflection. So he wants to get back. He wants you to get back to the person that he knew. See, everybody likes you for what they know. But God loves you by what you knew. Because at the end of the day... God knew you in your mother's womb, which means he got a purpose for your life. He got a plan for your life. Can I tell you something? That God knows you before you ever sinned your first sin. And that's why he always takes you back to the person that you call to be. Well, I'm going to teach now. Which means that if God formed you while you were in your mother's womb, lets me know that I had to be on God's mind before I showed up in my mother's womb. Oh. 
that, that, that. <laughs> that in order to form something with your hands, you got to have a picture of it in your mind. Because your hands are not articulate enough to make something if it doesn't know what to follow. So what the devil does is that he tries to rob you of your identity. This is why he put labels on your life. You're a drug addict. You're not a drug addict. That's a label. You're jacked up. There's no such thing as jacked up. That's a label. You're not good enough. What are you talking about? I'm made in the image of God. That's a label. And you don't realize that most of your life you've been living for the labels. And you've tried to get to know and fit in and discover the labels. When God knew you before you ever sinned your first sin. Because you were on his mind. This is why when you started to sin, what God started to form, you said, God, your hands are not good enough. So you put your life in the hands of others. Come on. Don't look at me like you were saved your whole life. That boy came in your life, said, baby, you fine like wine. You're like, oh, really? I'll give you my heart. And you gave your life and your heart to someone who's trying to get to know you. And you took your life out of the hands of the God who, know, who knew you. So this is why you went from being formed to becoming deformed. Because anytime you put your hands in the life of somebody that's trying to get to know you is a sign they didn't knew you. Which means they don't have the authority to make your life into the image of what you're always called to be. So you went from your life being formed, took your life out of the hands of Christ and put it in the hands of others. You put it in the neighborhood. You put it in the gangs. You put it in the drugs. You put it in the sex. You put it in all these type of things, and your life became deformed. Well, God couldn't leave you that way because you're distinctive. And God couldn't leave you that way is because you're the exception. So he says, okay. I was forming you, you walked away from me, put your life in the hands of others, and you became deformed because you became everything everybody else wanted to see in you. So God says, here's what I got to do. I formed you. They deformed you. I'm going to send Jesus to transform you. Come on, at the end of the day, Let's not minimize God to say God changes my life. No, God doesn't change my life. God transforms my life, which means he leaves no evidence of my deformity when I was in the hands of people that I didn't trust. Well, I got to hurry up. Watch this, number two. Your blessings flows down from God in proportion to the self-image you embrace by faith. You're, you're, watch this. Your blessing flows down from God in proportion to the self-image you embrace by faith. Let me hear it and go really quick. Watch this. 1 John 4, 17 says, The Lord has perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, not as he was, not as what he's going to do, as he is, so are we. So as he is, so are we. Why? Because if he is the substance, I'm the reflection. Which means so as he is, come on, so are. Come on, as he is, so are. Come on, as he is, so are. 
Now that means that if he, if he is life, I have life. Which means I have his mind, I have his nature, I have his name, I have his ability, I have his power, I have his wisdom, I have his favor, I have his love. Because at the end of the day, as he is, come on, so are. When was the last time God had a panic attack? When was the last time God stressed out? When was the last time God had an, was anxious? When was the last God last time God God couldn't sleep? When was the last time God had lack? As He is, come on, somebody, so are. And here's my last thing. Revelation of your royal exception and identity will take you from a life of an orphan to a life of purpose and significance as a true son and daughter of God. Of course you lived as an orphan. Because you detached yourself from the father. Which means you had no substance. Because man was never created to be a substance. See, a tree will never have a comparison problem. Neither will animals. They don't sit there and compare themselves with each other. Why? Because they were created as a substance. A tree is a tree. It will always be a tree and nothing but, but a tree. A dog is a dog. It will be a dog. It can never be nothing but a dog. A cow is a cow. It will always be a cow. It can never be nothing but a cow. Because those were all created as substances. You being the exception were created as a reflection. As an image. So when you walked away from the Father... You walked away from your substance, which means that things came into your life that you would reflect. It's why they call it substance abuse. He didn't create you to look like an alcoholic, but people would see that reflection on you. Come on, you go to a club. Don't act like you haven't been to a club. You see a girl, and you could act, that's a ratchet right there. You never met her. You never even went up to her and talked to her. But she reflected it. You wasn't in a club looking at that guy that's in the gym. He didn't have a 12-pack, but had a 15-pack. And you look at him and be like, that's a player. You never talked to him. You never had a conversation with him. But he reflected it. And the devil knew, if I get your identity, I'll rob you from your prosperity. And you will not have no fight because I took away your authority. And this is why you came to the way and you tried to fight your way out of this, but you couldn't. And the reason why you couldn't, because you can't have authority without prosperity. And you can't have prosperity and authority without identity. And so as I close, you, 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 you weren't walking around royal. You weren't walking around like someone who was living the exception. You're walking around as an orphan. I 
I'll prove it. You see, an orphan, they begin to focus on, on their faults and the faults of others. In other words, hurt people hurt people. So you just got in another relationship with a different face, but the same spirit. Once you focus on faults and the faults of others and hurt people, hurt people, hurt people, all of a sudden you experience rejection that leads to rebellion. Now all of a sudden you've been rejected, you got rebellion, and then you begin to lose basic trust and authoritative figures in your life. In other words, you begin to say things like this, well, I trust myself because I don't trust nobody else. That's a scary place to be. Then all of a sudden you fear submission. And the only, only reason why you fear submission is because you don't want to make yourself vulnerable to get hurt again. The problem is you got hurt by hurt people. This is why it's so hard for some of you to submit to the authority in the church. The reason why is because you think they're going to hurt you. But your pastors aren't hurt, hurting people. They're whole, healing people. I can submit to someone who's whole, but I won't submit to someone who's hurt. You lose, you fear submission, then all of a sudden you receive a closed spirit. Once you, once you receive a closed spirit, and then you take on an independent, self-reliant attitude. Then you take on a controlling spirit, and this is when you become manipulative. This is when you begin to manipulate things. You start to play the game. And then relationships become superficial because you don't open up. And now, to this point, you formed a stronghold. And next, you begin to live with an orphan heart and spirit. And watch this. And now you're attracted and are attracting counterfeit affections. All because you lost your identity. not walking in prosperity and you gave up your authority and you wonder why your life was being controlled by somebody who was stronger than you that when God gave dominion to man he says I'll give him dominion over the birds of the air the fish of the sea and every creeping creature but he left one thing out Man could never have dominion over man. And so when your life was being dominated and out of control, it was with a person who was an orphan themselves. Pastor Obed, as I close, how do I, how do I break this? It's simple. It's not hard. It's simple. You know what it is? You ready for it? Go back to being a son and a daughter. No, no, I'm because let me let me let me let me let me let me, let me, let me tell you the difference. A son or a daughter, they're secure. They have significance. They have identity. They have trust and patience. They're loyal. They're faithful. They're generous. They're humble. They're under and respects authority. They have vision for their future. They serve the father's house. They invest where his father's heart is, his discipleship. They're never jealous of other success. And they love people. That's a son and a daughter. Here it is.
there more Christians that are saved but still living like orphans? You want to know why? Because part of it Part of it is that all you know him as is that he's my savior. Jesus is my savior. Some of you, all you know him as, he's my rescuer. Like you... You wait till your back's up against the wall and you ran out of every option. And then you come to him and he say, Lord, rescue me. Some of you come to church. But don't get involved. Just want to be an attender and not a disciple. Because then all you know him as is a savior. Listen to me. If you only know him as a savior, you'll always be reminded you're a sinner. If you only know him as a rescuer, then you'll always be reminded he's the last resort. If just knowing him as my savior reminds me I'm a sinner and just knowing him as a rescuer reminds me that he's my last resort then it must be as equal. If I know him as a father then I will know that I'm his son and I'm his daughter. You see tonight way You know him as a savior. And you know him as a rescuer. But if you're going to live this life that God's called you to be, one that has a royal exception, you need to know him as a father. Because if you know him as a father, he'll love you like a daughter. He'll love you like a son. He'll invite you every time. Come on, he'll wrap his loving arms around you. He'll never see you lack another day of your life. When you can't go to bed, he'll comfort you. When you're confused, he'll renew your mind. If you don't know where to go, he'll grab your hand and he'll walk with you. Because the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. If you're in a battle, a father will come and fight for you. If you're going through a situation, Daddy will show up and he will show off in Jesus' name. It's what a father is. Come on, remain standing. I have one assignment tonight. One. And here's what the Holy Spirit said. God wants to change your life. The first thing that God gave Jesus, listen to me, because everybody wants the anointing. Give me the anointing. But it wasn't the first thing God gave Jesus. After 30 years of not hearing your daddy's voice, I know that if that was my son and I hadn't spoken to him for 30 years, the first thing I would tell him is, I love you. I miss you. But it's not what his father said. You know what his daddy said when he came up from the water? He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased with. You want to know why? Because the purpose of a father is not to give you just an anointing. The purpose of a father 
is to give you affirmation. Because when you don't have affirmation, you'll chase acceptance and approval. It's what you did. You got in a mess because you wanted acceptance. You wanted to be approved. You didn't want to go out and grab a gun and shoot another person. You just wanted to be approved by the OGs of that neighborhood because you were lacking affirmation. And the Spirit of God spoke to me, Pastor. Here's my assignment tonight. You're saved. You better be saved. Because you know him as a savior. You know him as a rescuer. But do you know him as a father? There's only certain wounds that can only be healed by a father. Listen to me. A savior can die for you. A rescuer can pull you out. But a father, he'll come and he'll rescue. He'll come and he'll heal you. And some of you today say, Pastor Obed, that's me. I don't feel royal still carrying shame and guilt and tonight you're going to feel the father's love you may not feel his power but you'll feel the father's love you want to know I love him because he first loved me now listen to me the ability to love is only contingent on being loved. I can't love you until I'm loved. And tonight, God doesn't want to overwhelm you with power. He wants to overwhelm you with his love tonight. That's what he wants. I don't know who I'm talking to, but the Spirit of God is here in this place. And on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to step out of your seats because we're going to pray for you tonight. Come on, we're going to pray that the Spirit of God will just come and just hover his love. A father's love. Listen, I didn't even have to count to three. People are already coming. Why? Because the anointing of God is drawing you tonight. You're getting your identity back. Come on, you're getting your identity back. Come on, you're going to get rid of the shame, get rid of the guilt, get rid of everything that you're supposed to get rid of. Come on, on the count of three, I need you to step out your seats and say, I'm coming down because I'm going to get loved by the Father tonight. I'm not walking out as a child. I'm not walking out as an orphan. I'm walking out as a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Come on, I've been given in Jesus' name. I'm not, I'm no longer going to live another day like that the rest of my life. Come on. And I just feel, man, I, I was praying this morning, Pastor, 4.30 this morning. I'm an early riser. I was praying this morning in the Spirit. The Spirit of God spoke to me and he says, listen, there's some people here tonight. And I'm going to go as deep as this. And I know it's deep, but it takes deliverance. And that is the fact there's some people tonight here that have been raped. And the Holy Spirit says it's been bothering you. It's been battling you. you. You can't get past it in some degree. You can't see yourself valuable. And the Holy Spirit says a father will come. A father will come. A father will come. I said a father will come. And he will heal that wound. He will heal that wound to, your, to the point that you'll forget about it. Because at the end of the day, the father. A father's love. A father's love. A father's love. Come on, let's start praying. Come on, let's start praying, prayer warriors. Let's start praying in Jesus' name. Come on, worship team.
God praise for the word we receive tonight. Now just know this, these nights have all been set up by God strategically so we can receive an impartation. On Wednesday, we really received the fire and how to get back our fire and our passion for God. Last night, we received an impartation for healing in the house. And tonight, it's really the DNA of our house, the love of God. We received an impartation, a revelation of God's love tonight. But Sunday, someone say Sunday. Sunday is the climax of everything. Pastor Marco has a word that's been brewing in his heart. And it's a word for this house. It's a word for all of our churches, all of our campuses. And it's going to unify the whole church together. Come ready because we're birthing out something this Sunday. Really, we're birthing out a, a new season of our church. A new wave is coming. I'm going to believe that this Sunday is going to be something brand new like we've never seen. Pastor Marco is coming with the word this Sunday, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. here at Hallmark. You don't want to miss out. It's going to be powerful. Can we give uh, Pastor Obed a round of applause for the word we received tonight? Thank you so much. We're going to stay up here at the altar and pray as long as we need to. If you need prayer, please come up here and let's pray together. Can we give uh, Jonathan Trailer a round of applause as well? Jonathan, who's over here, he's praying right now at the altar. If you want to support Jonathan, go buy some of his merchandise outside. I know he's got, does it, what does he have, CDs or books and things, shirts and things. Let's go buy some of those shirts. Let's support him and let's bless him. Let's bless the ministry. We love you so much, church. Remember, if God is for you, there's no one who can come against you. Let's come, let's come Sunday ready to receive, ready to do what God has called us to do. Altar workers, let's begin to pray. And don't forget to go to the Way app and click igotsaved.com. Click the I Got Saved banner and help everybody at the altar to fill that out. I Got Saved banner on the app. We love you, church. If you need prayer, come up this way. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you.